so welcome everybody to the Member Summit 2021 recap. We had a great meeting last week with a lot of the consortium members and consortium friends showing up for three days to talk about kind of what's going on in our services focused industry. My name is Matt Seaman. With me today are Kelly Murray, Arn van Ostfjord, and Sarah Feldman. Um, we're going to have a little bit of a discussion about the member summit and our key takeaways from the summit, what we found exciting, what we found interesting, and things that we think we might continue to work on over the course of the next year. We'll talk about some of these details, but a lot of interesting conversations took place that we have been spending the last week trying to digest and figure out how do we move some of those really interesting discussions forward and don't just put them behind us since it's what leads to new innovative concepts in the services industry. So before we kind of start deep diving into a little bit on what the summit was like last week, at every consortium event, one of the key things we try to do is get people out of their day-to-day -day world. We're all so busy, millions of emails, tons of Slack messages or Teams messages coming at us all day. So giving people a little bit of time to explore, space to think, and sharing ideas. Because once we've shared an idea, you can't put the idea away. So once we've shared something, once we've started to think about something in a new way, it's impossible to put it behind us. And it just helps us move forward and drive to a, a new location and a new exciting future. The consortium is made up of members. There's six of us on the staff of the consortium. And our main role is to connect really smart people that want to talk about interesting topics. We have about 60 member companies. This is uh, some of our benefactor and sponsor level members that really are the ones that drive the work forward. And while we work with a lot of interesting companies, all work for interesting companies, it really is about the people that make up the consortium and a group of very passionate, energized, thoughtful individuals that come together to work on new interesting things. Um, here's a few pictures from our summit. One of the things that I always enjoy about the member summit is it's just a good time. And it's hard to find pictures of people that aren't smiling or laughing as we go through the event. Maybe not everybody knows that we are secretly taking screen captures of some people when they uh, <laughs> look like they're having a good time to use in our, in our slides. But it's, uh, it's actually hard to go through the photos that are taken and find people that don't look like they're very engaged and having a great time. But a, a big thank you to all the people that showed up at the member summit, because that's what makes it so exciting is the people and how open they are to sharing ideas. And really, it's about this idea of collective learning and co-creating something. We have a, a body of work going on in the consortium around co-creation and the value of co-creation. And value isn't always realized by the outcome. Sometimes the value is realized by the journey trying to get to an outcome. Think about projects that you've been a part of in the past where the project never really delivers on what was intended, or maybe it gets halfway through and the company decides to go in a different direction. So sometimes the outcome doesn't deliver the value, but all of the interactions, the stakeholders coming together, people learning new ideas, sharing ideas is where value can be created. And everybody that shows up at consortium events, all of our people that make up this network are really volunteers. And it's the diverse perspectives and skills of all of these people coming together that allows for the movement of things like KCS or intelligence forming or the predictive customer engagement. It's the people that work on it and are brave enough to go test new ideas and try something new that help all those methodologies move forward. So the, the member summit was a, I'd say one of the most exciting events that I've had the pleasure of participating in in the consortium in terms of some of the ideas that were shared and we tried something new and had a whole day focused on thinking about ourselves, which was interesting, exciting. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we, uh, as we continue our discussion. Consortium members engage through a lot of different ways. Um, we host events throughout the year. 
And the kind of premier event is the member summit where we bring together all these great people. But we have action calls, webinars, which are open to anybody. You don't have to be a member of the consortium to attend any of the action calls or webinars. These are great ways to listen to what companies are doing. Um, people will come and share something specific that their company is doing. Sometimes it's what's going well, sometimes it's what's not going well and looking for advice. So there are great ways to get a pulse on what other people are doing in the industry and maybe help um, yourself move something forward in your own company. And all of those events are listed on the consortium website and kcsacademy.net website. So uh, check those out because we're adding action calls. I believe we have them scheduled out now through February. So we've got uh, quite, a, quite a list coming up. Yeah, through March now. Through That's March now. Point. So. So we've got, got events scheduled out through March. So look for those and um, share them if you see something that looks interesting for you or your coworkers. We've uh, shifted a little bit this year. We've started some communities of practice where members are coming together to discuss things around Salesforce or ServiceNow, um, a couple working groups to work on measurements and uh, some nurturing uh, culture and the culture of nurturing an adaptive organization and the culture you need for an adaptive organization. So a lot of great events and great communities coming together to move things forward. As always, the member Slack where the members can post questions, share ideas, talk about coffee, talk about being a KCS nerd. Again, it's a fun, fun place to come and interact with, with your peers. As we thought about the theme for the member summit and all the discussions we've been having with different member companies and some of the things coming out of our uh, executive discussions with leaders, there was a lot uh, over the last year of disruption, obviously, right? The impacts of the pandemic immediately threw us into this unknown territory where it was and kind of always has been impossible to predict what the future is going to look like. What is the future state we're going to be at? What are the future behaviors we have to think through? But the pandemic immediately forcing everybody into a distributed workforce, changing the way we showed up at work, changing the way we interacted with our uh, peers, with our own company, with customers, with management, with the, across the board, there was immediate disruption. And what we found were people quickly adapted to this new environment and found a new balance. And some of the member companies reported that they found new efficiency gains and they saw uh, people connecting more than they had ever connected before, especially remote locations started to connect far more than they had in the past. And not one of our members said that this happened because they had a playbook for exactly what to do when a pandemic hit and everybody immediately went remote they all reported that they found this new balance because they had smart, dedicated people that loved working with customers that were dedicated to making other people successful and they found this new balance. So as we talked with member companies that presented at the member summit and um, thinking about what we were hearing from our members, the summit focus really started to come into shape to talk about how organizations are reacting to external forces, as well as how we as people are showing up when faced with external forces. And this idea that there's these external impacts that we as an organization have to react to, but then organizations are made up of people. They're not these you know, random entities out there. It's, a, it's people that make up organizations. So how do we as people show up when faced with external forces? And so thinking about our organizations as being adaptive systems and how do we make it so that they're flex flexible and able to interact, uh, change with the times. And if we make our working practices and we make our teams and we make our organizations to be adaptive and to make them flexible, they can really handle any type of situation that comes up. And two models that we've been playing with to maybe help us think about our organizations different, differently are complex adaptive systems really coming out of systems engineering. So complex adaptive systems started in the systems engineering world. And then the Kinefin model, 
as a, a framework that lets you look at the problem and understand what domain it might be in and based on where it is, how you would react to solve that problem. And what we like about these two models is it helps us realize that not all situations are the same. And we often treat all situations as the same, no matter what the problem is, we try to tackle it the exact same way. But it, the Kinefin model offers us a way to categorize a problem and maybe look at the best way to respond to it. And then complex adaptive systems, they help us think through the fact that we can't control all of the interactions that take place in an organization between people, between people's systems. And especially in services environments, IT service management, technical support, we tend to have processes on top of processes, on top of measures, on top of more measures. And we do this because we're almost treating every transaction as the same and it should follow the same path, but they all follow different paths. And we try to add more control. And when things seem like they're unknown, we try to add more controls. Instead of maybe spending more time trying to get our organizations to understand what are the outcomes we're trying to get to, what is the why behind what we're talking about? What are the emergent patterns that we're looking for? And based on those emergent patterns, how do we influence the interactions, but we know we can't control those interactions. So two bodies of work that really speak to the time we're in and the shifting pressures that we have on our organizations, the shifting dynamics that we have in our workforce, the uh, challenges that some companies are facing with finding the right people and hiring. There's definitely a work shortage in the high-tech industry, and it's not, not going to get better according to some of the Forbes and Microsoft trends and other um, research organizations that are out there looking at what's going on in the industry. But two kind of interesting models that we've been playing with that help us maybe think about our organizations a little bit differently. And I think um, one of the things that we really liked about these two models as we were thinking about how we were going to transition back to or into the new normal, um, how could we keep some of the great sort of resilience and creativity mm. and flexibility that we experienced at the beginning of the pandemic, right? When, when everything sort of was new and a crisis, um, how can we keep some of that as we go sort of maybe back into the office or maybe back into sort of patterns that existed before we had to react in a crisis? And so these two um, models, I think especially spoke to us because it's really about understanding how we can influence patterns as opposed to going right back into the things that we always did. I think that's a great point, Kelly, because we talk about our comfort zones and we tend to want to go back into our comfort zone. And as people are going back into the office environment and they're going back to their comfort zone a little bit, or they're reaching a new comfort zone, some of those old patterns start to emerge, you see some new emergent patterns, which maybe aren't the ones we want, how do we keep that flexibility? Um, which is, is an interesting dynamic that we're gonna, going to all face in the, the coming months and year. So as we talked about kind of our, our organizations, we had some great discussions with um, some of our, our members and I know for me, uh, Michelle's presentation or discussion on the allure of intelligence swarming was an incredibly energizing discussion because it was less about necessarily intelligence swarming as a thing and more about what do you have to do to get your organization kind of lined up to a change. And I walked away from that more energized than I had been in a while thinking about uh, you know, how to show up as a leader um, and the things to think about. She really did an amazing job sort of distilling a lot of the, the things that um, they need to put in place to succeed. And um, what I think it's interesting also, she talked a lot about um, intelligence swarming really as a culture shift, right? As an opportunity to think about some things in a, in, in a different or maybe more holistic way, right? And how do we remove the barriers, the sort of arbitrary barriers to collaboration that we've set up in the organization? Yeah, I think the way she talked about Alteryx, 
um, and the challenges that they were facing when she joined the company is something so many companies are facing with the shifting product dynamic, going more and more towards a SaaS solution, um, trying to grow, but having some turnover with people leaving because of all the things going on and, you know, in the world and, you know, how do you get people to stay aligned to a mission and a vision and build a system that allows you to grow that maybe isn't just, okay, well, we've done this for the last 30 years, so let's just keep plugging away at it. But how do we change the way we're thinking about our teams and, and our organizations? One of, the, um, one of the things you said, which is a perfect lead in here, right, is um, that we can enable people who don't have all the knowledge to contribute. So especially when they're talking about turnover and, and how we get the right people in the right place at the right time and how we get that knowledge shared, um, both sort of um, asynchronously and maybe synchronously, I thought that was a, a really interesting way to frame up, um, you know, systems like this can help people, even if they don't have all the knowledge, to still be able to contribute. And everyone loved this slide. This was, this was Michelle's eight things that, um, that what they needed uh, in order to succeed. And, and some of the sort of mind shifts here were really, I thought, well summarized. My, my heart sang at a place where high performance is measured by contribution to the whole, which of course is an ongoing topic of conversation for consortium members and has been for years and will continue to be. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and the, the huge focus they have on, on the why and why are they doing what they do? Why are they an organization? What is the collective purpose of that organization? And they've spent a lot of time making sure everybody's aligned to the purpose of them being an organization, which is critical regardless of what you're doing, whether you're in a change state or not, having everybody understand their purpose is kind of one of the, one of the big intrinsic motivators that Daniel Pink talks about in Drive, which is a, a resource that we love. And after Michelle, it was Michelle's discussion was a perfect lead in to a open discussion with um, Melissa Birch from Zendesk and Laurel Portner from F5 hosted by our very own Sarah. And it was a, a kind of a perfect segue. So the Nurturing Adaptive Workforce is a body of work that people came together and work on, but it really fit into what Michelle was talking about in trying to get her organization focused on this change initiative. And, Sarah, I know you've been heavily involved in this, this work that's been being done. Maybe you want to tell us a little bit about kind of how the group came together and the work that was focused on. Yeah, so we, we do have a great new publicly available resource called Nurturing Adaptive Workforce that I think Kelly will throw a link to that in the chat for everyone. But what, what's interesting about how this work evolved over the past year is that we, a group of folks, a group of members came together and started thinking about, well, how do we nurture an adaptive workforce? How do we, as how do leaders help their employees evolve in this new normal, whatever that is? And it kind of revealed itself through our discussions that it's, it's more of a cultural situation than anything, more cultural than necessarily processes or your company structure. And, What's tricky about culture is it's it's quite emergent in the sense that you can't necessarily directly impact it, but this resource mm -hmm. that we have available and a conversation with Melissa and uh, Laurel, they talked a lot about how as leaders, you can create the environment and the conditions under which you want the right culture to thrive. And that it really takes a lot of intentionality as a leader. And one of the, my favorite things that they both touched on is how important modeling that right behavior, modeling adaptability, transparency, resiliency, how important that is to create those conditions for your team to be adaptable as well. A couple of things they mentioned in our conversation is a psychological safety. And an example they gave is that as a leader, when you make a mistake, be upfront about it. You know, leaders are humans too. And uh, be transparent, be upfront, explain what you're intending to do, why things didn't go according to plan, how you're gonna adapt as a result. Love that example. And yeah, in this new resource we have available, 
we as a as a group came up with some culture prompts to align your team around what are those qualities that you want to sort of govern how you work together and then a few sections uh, for guidance on interviewing whether you're a candidate or a hiring manager and some examples as you know leadership guidance to to nurture this yeah and i think one of the things which struck me about um the discussion, but also the the paper. I don't know what we call this framework paper, <laughs> the nurturing and adaptive workforce paper. It, it's very usable, and I mean, it does give you some interviewing questions, things you can use. Not that you should use this as a checkbox for we're just going to ask these thirty-seven questions, but these are questions collected from a lot of the member companies that different leaders are using when they're in the interviewing process or how they're looking at their organizations. And it's a tangible body of work that we're hoping people will use and then report back on what's working, what's not working, so we can continue to update it and keep it refreshed and alive because it really does fit into our thinking about how do we build a resilient organization that fits our culture as a company? But also if you're somebody who's looking for a job, making sure that you like the culture of the company you're getting interviewed by, because it's really a two-way relationship. It's not, oh, I just, I'm going to work here and I'm going to mold myself to be whatever they want me to be. It really should be a fit between the two. And, um, I know I sent this to you, Kelly, and I can't remember who said it, but it was something I saw on, I think, Twitter about, you know, you should ask yourself, do I want to be more like the people that are inter interviewing me? Because if I do want to be more like them, then it's probably a good fit for me. But if I don't really want to be more like them, then maybe it's not a great fit. So it's, it's a two-way street, and I think this paper helps people think through that. Um, so hopefully, you know, some of our, our brave members out there will play around with this and try it and report back on, on how it's going. And how many, how many companies worked on this? It was a large group of leaders from, from a diverse group of companies. I know we have them in the paper. Yeah, they're mentioned in the resources section of resources. the. Mm -hmm. And um, on, I guess it was day three, actually, that we had Pierre Marininchi from PTC come talk about KCS and across the enterprise and how do you adapt KCS for these other organizations? And he kind of kicked this discussion off at a team meeting we had focused on Europe. It was Arnfin and I hosted it. Arnfin was up at 4 a.m. his time and uh, me being on the East Coast, it was 6 a.m. So it wasn't too bad for me, but, um, but Pierre presented at that on kind of how PTC is thinking about as they scale KCS to all these different organizations. How do you get them on board with KCS without it being you have to conform to everything that we've built, but we need to keep some set of core principles in place. And it fit very much to me in terms of being an adaptive organization and helping yourself adapt. And I know one of the things Pierre talked about is at some point you're actually going to start pushing back because you feel like you've spent all this time for years building this amazing KCS implementation. You've got all these great best practices. PTC has um, well over 100,000 publicly available knowledge articles. And then people start going, yeah, but we don't like the way this works. You're like, well, I spent a lot of time building that. So, you know, I think you should like the way it works. But how do you be also become adaptive in listening to other people's ideas and knowing that just because you've built something doesn't mean you've actually done it the best way or there may, may be other ways to do it. And what I really liked about Pierre's presentation was breaking it down into there are core things that we all need to be focused on, but that doesn't mean everything has to be the same. And if we, I don't know, think about the measures, right? That we, we have to all have health measures and what are success measures, 
But the measurements probably aren't all the same because if you're in technical support, your measurements of success are probably different than if you're in a customer success management organization or a professional services field organization or a sales organization. And uh, I liked the way PTC is approaching. We're going to have kind of a, a core group of people who make sure that we're all implementing things and we're sticking to some standards. But as individual organizations, we each have to go off and build our own functional processes and we have to go build our own functional KPIs as long as we're not kind of breaking the core principles of KCS. And we're actually having uh, our upcoming KCS in action with Parsons. They have a very similar model and uh, encourage people to sign up for that because they have a similar thing where they have certain core must-haves to be able to join their portal, um, but they give so much flexibility. And so uh, that would be another one to, if you want to drill down on this area, I recommend sign up for that KCS in action later in October. Yeah, definitely looking forward to that one. And I think PTC is the March KCS in action call. So maybe you don't need to sign up for that one yet. That's pretty far out, but they're, yeah. uh, they're going to come, come talk about their, the advancements they've made in their KDA and KDE programs and, and how they're, they're thinking about those things. And then the, the last presentation of the, the day was uh, done by Christina Rusin and Matt Chin, hosted by Arnfin on understanding success by channel, which has been a member driven, um, member driven since 2019, I think it was the 2019 or was it the 2018 member summit where this question of there really is no industry standard for how we should measure success in the growing number of channels we have. So when people are coming in through a self-service portal, doing support through social networks, all these different areas, how do we measure success? And so a group of companies have come together to help try and define that. And Christina and Matt gave an update with a focus on communities uh, and the work that's now being done on communities and Arnfin has been heavily engaged in helping coordinate the meetings and the activities being done by these members. And Arpin, do you want to say a few things about the work that's been done by this group of people? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, it was nice. We have uh, some small companies and some very large companies. And uh, companies include high tech, uh, financial, gaming, and service organizations. And our uh, verified line vendors are also nicely represented. And from these companies, we have a very large group of volunteers uh, working on this project and want to thank that team for all their contribution. We're not quite finished with this phase, but uh, um, a tremendous amount of work has already been and done in this project and we reported out on that. In fact, on the, the next slide, if you'd like to go, um, in phase one, Christina introduced us to the three Ds, the digestible, durable, and defensible. And uh, we presented that in our last report out on the uh, self-service success. And this resonated well with the team and we continue to use that for phase two, the communities on uh, this project. But as we got underway, we realized we needed to add another D, that last one, the uh, don't double count. And this was a big uh, aha moment for the team and many were revisiting their measurements as a result. And then we leveraged, uh, you can see on the, uh, the left, we leveraged the template from phase one and expanded it for phase two for communities. And we wanted to use the same approach uh, and format to ensure that it was easy to understand, again, that digestible and easy to present. And uh, this aligned format also helps us with that fourth D, the don't uh, double count. And um, yeah, we're having great discussions in this working group and welcome any member who would like to join our discussions. We meet uh, every other Thursday. So please let Kelly or me know if you'd like to be added to the invite list. And a key deliverable when we complete this phase will be thorough documentation and supporting videos, uh, similar to what we did in phase one. So we'll announce uh, when these are available and these will be for both uh, available for both members and non-members. And one of the interesting things about what the group has come up with, it's not 
a huge list of things to go track. There's not pages and pages of Excel files to fill out. It's pretty, I don't wanna say simplistic because getting some of the numbers, my understanding is getting the numbers themselves may not be simple at all, but it's not something that is overly complicated where you then need to figure out, well, what numbers am I gonna show leadership or how are we going to um, make these real for people? The numbers are fairly self-explanatory in terms of their meaning, which is um, I think more powerful when you can really keep it short in terms of what you're measuring. And another body of work that is being worked on is uh, healthy measures or the health of your measures. So it's less about these are measures you should be using, but how do you take the measures you are using and make sure that you're using them in a healthy way, that you understand what they mean, and when you see trends, are you doing anything with that trend or are you just creating graphs to create graphs? Since um, it seems like a lot of people like to create fancy graphs so that they have fancy graphs, but don't ever do anything with the graph. So a lot of great pieces of work coming together and starting to you know, kind of support each other in terms of here are some measures you can use, but then also what's the health of those measures and are they being used the right way? So a great and, discussion. And yep. I was just going to say that was a key point. One of our key audiences for this project were the executives. Because as you're, whether it's uh, rolling out KCS, self-service communities, you want to make sure that you're tying all of your activity and, and outcome metrics to true business value. And we wanted to make that, again, very simple, very easy to digest. And uh, we did drill down, though, what we found in the communities is that there's really two main, there's new and known. There is um, viewing existing threads for the known and it's uh, posting new thread for the new. And we had to measure those uh, differently, but uh, we combine those all up for, summarize those all up for the executive. So again, we wanted to make sure it was very easy to digest. And as Arnfin said, we're definitely looking for people to take these numbers and try them and see how they work in your environment and report back out on, on how it's going. And then to try something different at the member summit this year and having a goal of making it not just another Zoom conference, we had Caitlin Frost from Harvest Moon Consulting come and really focus on us as people and how we as people react. So a lot of the presentations on what are we doing around the culture of, of an adaptive organization? How are we going to structure our thinking around organizations? What are some of the things we're doing with KCS and rolling out across a enterprise? These were all really focused on those external things that we're trying to accomplish as a company or an organization. And our entire day with Caitlin really shifted that to be about how are we as whole capable humans showing up and um, struggling maybe with some of our own limiting beliefs that stop us from thinking creatively when we're faced with challenges and maybe going back into our own limiting beliefs as our guiding principles, instead of maybe stopping ourselves and going, why am I reacting this way? Why does this feel uncomfortable? And it was a very energizing and exhausting day for me, right? To go through this, this journey of, of discovery. Um, but the techniques that Caitlin gave us, it's so easy to, almost observe when you're reacting a certain way, but she gave us the techniques to say, okay, well, let's stop for a minute. And here's a, here's a framework you, you can use and a piece of paper you can actually write stuff on to maybe get yourself unstuck. And it was a really interesting fun day with, I think we had 80 people on for the, uh, for the day to kind of engage and think about how they're showing up in an environment. And Matt very bravely demonstrated this technique in front of those 80 people, which is why it was a long, hard day for him. <laughs> <laughs> but a fun day, I enjoyed it. <laughs> and I think one of the, the keys for me that um, 
Caitlin brought up was this idea of a reactivity loop, uh, which we love loopy things in the consortium because they're self-correcting. But apparently sometimes the reactivity loop is not self-correcting, but self-destructive in terms of it amplifies your own stresses and reactions to things. It amplifies your limiting beliefs where you, as a human, seek out ways to strengthen your limiting belief instead of maybe question your limiting belief. And I, I loved her taking us through the reactivity loop and the fact you can't help it. I mean, your brain is pre-wired to protect yourself and it does that in the fight flight. We all kind of talk about fight and flight, but your brain is wired to protect itself. And so when you're in a work situation, you most likely are not in a situation where you need to run for your life because you're being chased by a bear. Maybe there are some jobs where that happens, but I don't think anybody on the member summit showed up that is in a job like that. But how do you, when you get to those emotional reactions and your limiting beliefs start taking over, almost how do you pause yourself and stop thinking that way, but understand why you're thinking that way so you can make a better decision or open up your creativity? So one of the things that I found so interesting about this, this whole sort of exercise, right, was one of the things that came up with the nurturing and adaptive workforce group is the recognition that leaders are really responsible for identifying and communicating patterns, right, looking at sort of like what the desired patterns are that we want to continue and, and maybe figuring out ways to interrupt undesirable patterns. And this was such an interesting look then at sort of personal patterns in terms of where can I interrupt an undesirable pattern that I'm running in my head and, and how does it really make us sort of more present or, or available as leaders. So. I love I loved the the internal patterns and the external patterns kind of a bit opportunity to identify those things. Yeah, and Caitlin did a great job of leading us as a group through um, identifying some of our own limiting beliefs in a very safe and easy way. Talking about you know when have you been in a situation where you showed up and felt like you really showed up with your whole self and were, you know, a leader in that situation. And I love the way she defined a leader as anybody who shows up to contribute is a leader. And I liked that because we often think of leaders as a title. Leadership has very little to do with your title. It's got more to do with how you show up and the presence you have. Um, and so I really liked that definition from her um, of what a leader is. And as part of that exercise, she had us uh, as a group use the chat in Zoom and asked us to think of a specific situation where we as people maybe didn't show up in a helpful way. And what are the words that came to mind or the situational things going through your head when you were in that? And this is a, a word cloud of what people wrote. And it's amazing when you think about the words people are using around defensive and negative and frustrated and I was a toddler and <laughs> all these things that I think we all can recognize every now and then we start to behave this way, we start to act this way when we're challenged. And then she asked us to think about a person whose leadership or way of showing up in a challenging situation was inspiring to you. And the words people use around empathetic and calming, um, providing space to think is almost a roadmap for, oh, when I start to show up this way, maybe I can pause, recenter myself, and then even if it's difficult, start displaying some of the other behaviors that um, people look to in order for them to think of me as a leader. Um, and I really like these as just word clouds of leadership qualities that the 80 people were just throwing in the chat window as Caitlin was, was talking and presenting on these two topics. Now I know Sarah Arnfin or Kelly, if you have any comments on this? Cause this was to me such an eye-opening experience of just watching the chat window scroll by with all these amazing words and then all these negative words based on the question that she was asking us. Yeah, this uh, this was an aha moment for me for sure. Cause of course I was thinking back to a time when maybe I didn't behave perfectly and and uh, some of the 
some of what I described is knowing in the moment that you're not modeling the right behavior, but feeling like maybe you don't have control over it and connecting that to her definition of leadership. And that even when you're not in a leadership role, if you're contributing, you are a leader, connecting that back to other conversations where it's so important to model the right behavior. I want to believe that next time in that moment where I feel like maybe I'm not in control of my maybe less than desirable behavior, I will be able to interrupt that cycle and model the right behavior, you know, connecting all those dots and feeling that responsibility as a leader, no matter what my role is. It was definitely a, a great day with Caitlin and at least the, the comments we received afterwards, I think we accomplished our goal of not having just another Zoom conference day with a bunch of people talking at you. Cause we, we broke up into pairs and practiced the techniques. Um, so we, we had a lot of breakout rooms where people were practicing with each other and helping identify limiting beliefs and then working through the, the worksheets that Caitlin provided us to think a little differently than maybe we do on a day by day basis. Uh, open space, which is always just, I'm shocked at the level of details and conversations and topics that people think up through open space. We did two open space sessions hosted by Kelly, who is a master at hosting open space sessions and getting everybody set up and has done a really quite amazing job of shifting to a virtual open space and keeping that same feeling alive that you get when you do this in person. But what do we have? Maybe 12 different topics, Kelly? Something yeah, like that? Yeah, 10, 10, 10 or 12 topics. Um, my, I was think, looking at them. We, we had a lovely conversation on the staff yesterday about all of the topics that came up and all of the um, follow-up that might come out of these. And uh, one of them, as we were going through, I was laughing because one of the topics um, pr uh, proposed by David Kay, a conversation that he facilitated was how do we turn more leaders into Michelle, who um, had our had our great list of you know eight things you need for success in a swearing environment. Um, so I'm not sure that they figured out the exact alchemy during that session, but some <laughs> some great notes uh, that are in there. Uh, so and that's one of the actually one of the most fun things about doing open space online is everybody comes into this Google slide situation and it's where we propose topics and then it's where we capture notes. So we have some great notes that. Um, are all in one place, but, uh, which is a thing that sometimes didn't happen when we were in, in real space, so. Or we would have to try and decipher the chicken scratch we would get from somebody right. of the well, notes that they took that were- Yeah, or I'd find, up. you know, a stack of handwritten notes in my computer bag two weeks later and be like, I should probably do something with those so other people could see them. <laughs> We yeah, have a lot of great notes taken and from this we've captured some next steps. We'll be reaching out to uh, some of the people that hosted the events to maybe talk about some some next steps. These are two of the two of the different discussions that took place and kind of the notes we had here. And I, I just love the at room to be and yesterday we were reviewing these really struck with me just the the credit dilemma like recognizing that value creation is such an interesting topic and one that is a big discussion amongst a bunch of leaders as we understand that just measuring activities, like how many cases somebody closes in a day in no way reflects their value to the company, right? Because as we all know, if we tell people the, the, the currency of your success is closing a case, they, that people will close the cases, but may not be doing it in a way that is great for your customers. And um, I love the discussion around the credit, the credit dilemma, I think is a, fun topic. My favorite next step that was captured in, in one of the topics was something along the lines of, we will continue talking about this until the end of time. And I love that one because for, for certain things, that's just, we know we're just going to have to keep talking about it. Well, we might not ever solve it, but it's worth continuing to talk about. And there are probably many of those. It's probably more than one topic that we will talk about forever. So. And as Armfin mentioned, we've got a lot of great events coming up and the one with Parsons on October 20th. Um, but 
if you go to serviceinnovation.org events, we have a list of, I don't think it's all the events we have planned out because putting on the calendar an event that's gonna happen in nine months is not that useful for most people, I don't think. But um, we have everything posted at least through the end of November. And I think there's a bunch posted for December as well. So uh, great place to come check it out. Some of these are open to the public. Some are for members only. The adaptive system series is something new we're gonna try where there are maybe shorter series of conversations and the next conversation will develop based on the first conversation. So something we're gonna play with. So members, please feel free to sign up for those. They're on, on the event calendar. And we have an amazing group of certified trainers um, that are really out there helping companies around the world implement KCS, thinking about intelligence warming. So uh, the kcsacademy.net is all the upcoming workshops being hosted by certified trainers. So I, I also think this is a great way to just get a refresh on what's going on with KCS. So even organizations and companies that have been using KCS for a long time, sending a program manager or a KCS manager or somebody that's heavily engaged in KCS to one of the certified trainers external courses is a great just refresher to maybe recenter on the actual practices of KCS and getting getting yourselves recentered. So check those out. And um, those are being updated all the time as new courses are added. And all of this is on the wiki. One of the maybe only benefits of going to all remote is capturing notes like Kelly mentioned for open space, but also all the videos of the presentations that are done at any of the events, the presentations themselves that are done by member companies are all captured in the members wiki, mainly organized by the year they took place. We're starting to categorize them as well by topics. So it's easier to, um, to maybe find if you're focused on intelligence warming, you don't have to go find all the team meetings that took place on intelligence warming, but you can just go to the intelligence warming tab and find, find all the resources on intelligence warming. But if you're a member and don't have access to the wiki yet, feel free to reach out to us. Everybody who's a member has access to the information in the wiki. So feel free to reach out to us if you don't have it. And definitely recommend in there in the member wiki, the search is very nice. So if you're interested in intelligence swarming or communities, you can just put that in the search and find where that was discussed at any of the program meetings. After I search three times, I ask Kelly and she tells me that's the force I'm searching search. wrong. So exactly. I'm not an optimized search engine. So one of the fun things about the event was all of the different um, takeaways that we saw in the Slack window. And these are some of, the, some of the comments that we received from people across the chat in Slack. And it's hard to Hard to express how exciting it was having all of these people come together, how open and sharing everybody was with ideas, challenges, uh, participating with Caitlin to open ourselves up a little bit and be a little bit vulnerable in front of each other to talk about some of our challenges and limiting beliefs. I wanted to thank everybody that's a member of the consortium and everybody that's a part of the greater community of the consortium that makes all of this work possible and helps drive these methodologies forward. And then he froze. Wow, He's was... been having internet trouble all day and he froze at the perfect, amazing concluding time. Exactly. That was incredible. Well, thank you, everybody. It's been so great seeing you all. Anybody who's on, who was there, have any um, observations that we missed? Or if there's any questions from anybody? Yeah. That anyone besides Matt can answer because exactly. Matt is <laughs> no longer available. <laughs> Amazing. 
Oh, thanks yeah. for, oh. Go. The only thing I was gonna say was just, even though it's like, you know, a summit ago about, you know, knowledge being the product, almost all the notes you saw again was like frustration of people trying to figure out how to get it to that level. They know it's supposed to be there, they can't get it there. And then all the causes and the problems that it causes when it's not. So mm -hmm. I, I saw that over and over again. And when you look at the notes of all the rooms of people with it chatting about, so. Yeah, so true. People, people are a thing in this whole system. Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty wild. You know, Kelly, I was reflecting on um, so much of my job is to focus on the behaviors of others and to coach the behaviors of others. That's like 98% of my job. Um, and to have the chance to be able to carve out time to reflect on my behaviors and my responses was such a treat. Um, and it kind of made me realize that I think sometimes I just, I kind of go too far in that side of the pendulum. I'm just focusing on other people a little bit too much. And, you know, that, that saying about making sure your mask is on before you put the mask on the others. Um, and so that was, I really want to thank you for carving out that time for me um, and to helping me remember that that's a good thing. So thank you. I'm so glad I got a, I got a text message last night from another member friend who said, I totally use some of that Caitlin stuff to help my wife talk through a thing. And I was like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> well, thanks everybody. It's great to have you with us this morning. Um, this, this recording will be posted. Please let us know if there are other topics that we should be chatting about and we'll hope to see you at an upcoming event soon. Have a great rest of your day. Great. Bye, all. Bye-bye. Right,